Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Robert Reeves, and uh, my privilege to be assembling this Graduate Arts Campus, uh, which is a wonderful work in progress. And we started with creative writing, uh, fiction, poetry, memoir, various forms of creative nonfiction, and then we added theater, and we have acting and directing and playwriting and screenwriting and filmmaking. And I was beginning to wonder, what did we leave out? And what we left out, of course, is uh, visual arts and the person we uh, brought in to launch a program that would be doing something interesting that might be the next step in a particular art form, uh, which is what we try to do uh, in all of our disciplines uh, in a time when everything in the arts is changing. Uh, but what we have arrived in this kind of organic work in progress is the example you see in the, the gallery of those gorgeous uh, prints, this opportunity for amazing collaborations. And in this gorgeous new library, which I think is the probably one of the most, two or, two or three most beautiful buildings on the East End, we have someone representing tonight another gorgeous building on the East End. Uh, but we are now at the pre, uh, print studio, we are making books in the library, which is really how it should be. And the person who has made all of this possible is my friend and our new faculty member and wonderful leader of our visual arts program, Scott Sandell. So thank you all for coming tonight. This is great. This is our um, second night of our second session and our first visual arts presentation. So this is great. <laughs> So it was about like a year ago and Bob Reeves calls me up and he says, look, you know, I want to do this visual arts thing and, and we need to have this on our campus. This is the missing part. We've got everything else. We've got all these other things going. How do we do this? And I said, well, you know, what we should do is, you know, we need to um, create a print studio where we could have artists come in and create original work on campus. And we could, we could our, you know, our talent out here on the East End is extremely deep. Uh, in the visual arts, and we had, um, you know, it's, it's making prints is just a great way to do this, to, to start uh, a, an original process. And um, so Bob's going, well, that's great. Well, what else can you do? And I'm thinking, well, you know, we can do artist books. We can do installation pieces. We can do theater sets. And this light bulb goes off over his head, and he goes, artist books in the library. This is great. So. Um, so that's what we're doing, and we're, we've already brought in um, five artists to date in, into the almost beachfront digital print studio. And we're starting off with a sort of a digital orientation, but we're going to be adding uh, other mediums as we go on, silkscreen, hopefully lithography, hopefully etching, and I'm very much looking forward to that. And um, uh, we've got artists coming in in the, in the future, the next week. Um, we have five more artists coming in, and you can see the, the work that we've done so far. Remember, there are works in progress. These are working proofs. Um, the artists have had one, maybe two days to, to start a project, and these will be projects that will go into the fall, and uh, we'll be publishing certain works from this series of our, um, projects uh, through our new wing in the, um, of TSR Editions, uh, which will publish fine art prints, and um, artist books, so we're very excited about that. So um, the second thing that, that I talked with Bob about as, as far as creating a program was to um, get artists to come and talk to us and create a dialogue with students on the campus and get people, start to get people thinking visually. And uh, tonight we're uh, extremely lucky to have two um, superstars, in my opinion, uh, on campus um, with us. And um, we're really celebrating their um, appearance here tonight. So um, let me just mention uh, uh, Terry Sultan's arrival on the East End. This is a, a woman who is really surrounded by art. Uh, she, you know, her husband is a painter and a critic. Um, her brother is a painter. Um, she's got this 
great museum. This is a person who was able to create, build a new museum in the depths of the worst recession we've had that, you know, that anyone can remember. And uh, she seemed to do it without breaking a sweat. So this is quite an accomplishment. And she arrived here from um, the Baffler Gallery in Houston um, at the University of Houston. Before that, she was at the Cor uh, Corcoran Gallery in DC. And uh, bef before that, at the New Museum in Manhattan. So she has a little experience and she's bringing uh, exciting shows, very exciting programming, and uh, it's, it's just terrific that, that she's here with us tonight. Um, now she's going to be interviewing Eric Fischel, who um, really doesn't need much introduction out here, but uh, I will say that uh, I think it was 1983, and um, I, I think it was at the Whitney Biennial, and I saw these, these paintings on glassine, and he, he lined up the glassine, sort of in juxtaposed different layers of glassine, and I just thought this was like such an original approach, and, and it was something, you know, something I hadn't seen before, and I thought, this is great. And then he painted it, and the paintings were great. Um, and I thought, this was, this was really a, a unique and interesting direction, because with a, a very um, terrific degree of economy, he could tell a, a complete story. And his, as he went on and, and went to make big oil paintings, um, everyone has a complete story. Um, and if you've ever seen one of his shows, you can, you, you'll certainly agree. Um, so he went on to have uh, numerous shows, not only at Mary Boone's, uh, where his, I think his first big New York show was, but um, throughout the world. And, and uh, the show we're going to focus on tonight, largely, is, uh, uh, was actually a double whammy. It was two shows uh, in Mary Boone's 57th Street Gallery and her gallery in Chelsea, both dealing with portraiture. And this is an interesting time in, in history because, um, you know, think about it, every day, you know, there are maybe millions of new portraits posted on Facebook, and we're thinking about ourselves in different ways. And um, it's really interesting to have someone who can stand back and address this subject in, in, in such a creative way. And so we're, we're very uh, lucky to have him here tonight. So uh, won't you please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Eric Fischel and Terry Salton. Terry has a disclaimer. <laughs> well, you know, because we're iconoclasts, we always uh, say one thing and then do another. But uh, I'll start by saying that lately, Eric and I have been spending uh, quite a bit of time together because we're working on a project for the Parish Art Museum for next summer. Uh, which will be in conjunction. Is that me? Possibly me, because my microphone is back here. Oh. Um, which will enforce really good posture, which means we'll probably only be talking for about five minutes. Um, uh, we're doing a project together for the Parish Art Museum next summer uh, in conjunction with a historical exhibition that we're doing exploring the intersection of uh, creativity between uh, Pollock, Osorio, and Dubuffet. And that is a relatively small exhibition, so I was thinking, who else do I know that had a similar kind of relationship that fomented a lot of creative ideas and, uh, and certainly made an impact uh, in the cultural dialogue and contemporary art? And it was very obvious uh, to me at the very beginning that it would be Eric Fischel, Ross Blechner, and David Solly. So we have been, the, the four of us, speaking quite a bit. So even though you're expecting us to talk about uh, uh, Eric's, so, uh, Eric's portrait shows, uh, we're not. <laughs> we're going to talk about something else. We're going to talk about narrative, uh, storytelling, and creative process. Because when I saw the very first painting of yours that I saw, which was Bad Boy, in, I think, 1980, 
seven, is that right? I, I don't know, I made it in 82, so. Well, it was probably, then maybe it was like 85 when I saw yeah. it. But I, I looked at that painting and I immediately thought of John Updike. Uh -huh. And I thought, there's a, a, a whole narrative story behind this painting, and I wonder what it is. And I wonder, where did Eric get his idea? What story did that narrative come from? Mm -hmm. And it made me curious and start to think about how artists that sit in their studios and make something out of nothing every day, walk in, look at a blank canvas, and have to come up with something to do, where does your inspiration come from? Well, I, um, uh, it, it took me a while to sort of find my process. Um, and my uh, uh, sort of discovery of, of how I think creatively uh, came when I discovered this paper, this glassine paper. <clears throat> because it... Uh, it accepts oil paint very easily, so it's, it's a pleasure to schmear. And uh, its transparency uh, enabled me to um, sort of project my imagination onto the wall. So what I would do with this, and uh, there's, uh, say this, uh, is I would, I'd put a chair on a piece of paper and I would sit in my studio and I'd stare at that chair and I'd say, okay, so uh, there's a chair here. Is there anybody sitting in the chair? Are they standing in the chair? Are they walking by the chair? Are they, are they the only one there? Is there somebody else there? And I, every time I had a thought, I would get another piece of paper and I would project it and um, now, when you say project... I, I, I'm sorry, I, would pr I project in my imagination. Not, I, d I draw freehand, not, not project. Not using yeah. the old-fashioned no. overhead projector to no. put an image on there. No, I would just, I would just take, uh, say, okay, there's somebody, uh, as you, you saw in this first one, for example, this boy is in the, uh, sitting on a bicycle over some period of time. He's moved to a rolling chair, and his sister is now on the bicycle. And it was just a, a, a thing of sort of going through, t asking myself questions, to telling myself stories. Uh, so it unlocked a, a, in me a, a, a way of, um, uh, you know, the, the, not unlocked, but it showed me that I create things through association. And I don't question the I impetus, I, I just simply work with it it either works or it doesn't work or it works in a different situation but not in this one particularly Think, things that are germane to how i'm feeling stay things that i'm you know fantasizing about tend to fall away and stuff so so there might be a character that uh, comes to you through a story that you're telling yourself that might not actually end up making it into a particular scenario but could be held back and inserted into another one? Yes, it, it, especially uh, and with the glassine drawings, of course, because you just take them off, roll them up, put them mm -hmm. over there, and then, you know, weeks later, months later, you've, you've got another chair. And yeah, you so go, okay, let's see if it works in this. Well, I wonder what know. happened to that kid in the bicycle yeah, and what did exactly. he do to his sister? And then yeah. you go and find him and unroll it. But um, that, uh, that process of, of uh, working uh, led me to make paintings and try to, uh, partly because I, I felt that if, uh, as much as I liked the uh, glassines as a material and I, as much as I liked it as a, an ease of process and stuff like that, I actually ne never thought that it could achieve the, the level of, of sort of heroic gesture that a painting can. That, that in order to be a great artist, you had to really tackle painting, which meant you had to handle color and you had to handle uh, uh, surface and, and form and you know, all of those things in a, in a, in a way. So uh, 
I, I went with that, plus it was also the, just trying to tackle a rectangle as opposed to a free-form thing. Uh, so I moved to the canvas. Now th this painting, which is my most famous slash notorious painting, <laughs> uh, Bad Boy, which you referenced, right. is a painting that uh, I started knowing only that I wanted to paint a bowl of fruit. <laughs> so, go figure. Well, it's quite uh, prominently there. It's, it's true. very much there. And the, you know, the, the, the thing of like, okay, so you put the bowl of fruit in. Now you ask yourself, I ask myself, where is it? Well, it's on a table or mm -hmm. something, right? So you, I put that in. And then I was sort of like, okay, the table in some room, what room could that be in, et cetera. And I was sort of thumbing through a magazine and I saw this like bamboo curtain, you know, light streaming through. I thought, oh, cool, striped, that'd be fun to paint. So I, I put that in. And, uh, and somehow between the sort of putting that in and de deciding that this was a bedroom, there was something about the color of the wall and stuff, it reminded me of Arizona, where I'd lived for some time, and it reminded me of these sort of ad adobe houses where in the heat of the day, it's still cool inside. Mm -hmm. and, and I was thinking siesta, and I thought, okay. And then I, I got into this idea of a, like a post-coital siesta moment, you know? And, and, and so I put these two adult figures in, and it didn't work. And, uh, you know, I struggled with it for a while and I just couldn't make it work. And I'd, I'd learned over time that if, if I can't actually paint the figure right, it's because they don't belong there. Hmm. And I couldn't get the guy in there. So he leaves. And uh, I roll her over. And uh, so she's the way she is now. But I kept thinking there's somebody else in this room. And I, um, I thought, maybe it's a little baby. And I, so I painted a little baby next to her head. And that didn't work. So then I thought, man, you know, it's probably like a five-year-old kid or something. So I put this, painted this kid on the edge of the bed, sort of putting his finger through the blinds, looking. That didn't work either. Eventually, it turned out to be this, you know, sort of 10, 11-year-old boy and standing there watching. and. You know, and, it, and at some point I was like, what is he doing? What, you know, what is, it? and I thought, oh, I get it. He's stealing something. And uh, so I put the hand in the purse, et cetera, and that was the, the painting. Do you keep records of uh, the painting as it progresses? Do you have images of the other things that you tried that didn't work before you came to that solution? Uh, I wish I did back then where the images are, are buried underneath mm -hmm. uh, the painting and so I don't really have a record of it. Uh, but over the years I started to make collages and uh, go through, uh, do it in Photoshop and so I have a record of all of the thought processes, mm -hmm. all of the changes that are happening then. But that, that's, you know, these early ones were... Uh, sort of blind journeys. I, I show you this one, which to some extent is a, uh, it was done several years later and it's kind of a bookend to, uh, to Bad Boy. It's called Birthday Boy. But the other thing that's important to me in terms of constructing a narrative is point of view. It's like, where am I witnessing what I'm seeing? Mm. You know, it's where do I want to put the viewer? And when I was painting uh, this painting, for the longest time, I had the viewer seeing it through a fishbowl, an, an aquarium, actually, that, that covered the, pretty much the whole uh, thing. And you would see this thing back there, and there were fish in it and stuff like that. And, uh, and that, that went for a while until it seemed uh, too, too artificial. Uh, uh, device and I got rid of it, so. Do you read a lot of fiction? I don't, actually. So the no. narratives that you make up are just 
coming straight from your own experiences or just what you would imagine? Even yeah. as you were speaking at the very beginning about how you were, you know, you had a chair and then you had a boy, it almost sounded like a poem a little bit. Uh, I wish. <laughs> I'd give up everything to be a poet. <laughs> of course, if you be a poet, you do give up everything. <laughs> well, you can always be a comedian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, the poet comedian, Eric Fischel. He's, yeah. No, I... Uh, I, I, I read, but I don't read a lot. I'm not a, a good reader. I have a little bit of dyslexia, so it's a long process of reading. But uh, I grew up, uh, you know, in the suburbs. I grew up in a, an environment where, you know, you went to the museums only for, you know, school trips kind of thing. And, and mostly I was informed by TV and film. Right, and uh, you know, film obviously is one of our great narrative mediums. Uh, you know, visual mediums. It 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 certainly took out the lion's share of uh, territory that painting used to occupy. Mm -hmm. uh, photography took out the rest. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, uh, th so those were the first things that informed me. So I think there's a natural uh, relationship that I have to trying to. Uh, tell things through story, uh, you know. Well, you mentioned point of view, too, which is what made me ask you about the reading, because you know, there's various ways to enter into a narrative. Uh, certainly, that's true of movies uh, and photography. But when I think of literary compositions, you know, you can have first person, second person, omniscient observer, et cetera. And you, know, you were talking about, where am I standing in the room? How mm. am I observing this? So, when you say you, you're the creator of the narrative, but you're keeping your audience in mind as well. You're trying to direct where they are. Yeah, you're, I'm trying to place them. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, a lot, a lot of uh, early work that I did uh, was from a child's point of view. So you'll notice in the early work how the horizon line is tilted up. Mm -hmm. It's like you're looking up into something. You know, it's a, you're, you're smaller than the thing that you're looking into. And, uh, and so that's one device to use is where that picture plane actually is. Uh, you know, over a period of time, that kind of lowered and it became an eye to eye thing. But it's, it, if you, if you're painting one person and that person is looking at you, right? It's a very different relationship that you enter in than if, that, if there's one person and that person is not looking at you but is looking over there, right? It, it triangulates you in a very different way. If you paint two people uh, that are relating to each other, then you're removed from the, from the action in some way, right? And, it, it, you know, so it's things like that that I think about. It's like, it, it's like, you know, how am I seeing it? Where am I seeing it? And then I think, is it a comfortable place to view it from? Is it a safe place? Is it a compromised space? Is it a illicit space? Is it a dangerous space? Mm -hmm. is, you know, what is it that that uh, I'm I'm going for here? And, oh. and do you ever come to a, a definitive? knowing of what kind of space you're creating, or do you seek to maybe suggest a certain kind of space, but, but it could have another up, uh, interpretation? Well, I'm hoping that I, uh, the painting that ultimately gets done leaves plenty of room for somebody else to interpret it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, Whatever it is that I'm bringing into the painting, I'm trying to paint myself out of it in, in that specificity. It's, I, don't, I don't hold the people to the same interpretation that I have. What I do is try to create a space that is alive. Mm -hmm. so, so people automatically go, wait, what's going on here? What did a, so I mean, that's the most important question, what's going on? What's going on, yeah, which is, is for me the question, and oftentimes, I have no idea. By the time I'm done, I have no idea. I've projected possibilities and they didn't work, they didn't work, but the fact of it stayed this, as riveting as, as that. So, I mean, this painting that you're looking at right now uh, started out it's a, as a singular event. It was this painting. And uh, when I finished it, 
I was sitting there and I was staring at it and I noticed one thing which I think you would notice yourselves when you're looking at it but not necessarily in the slide form but anyway what I noticed was that if I stared at her because she was so luminous and she was so internalized and, and, and you know, she was just this self-contained thing and glowing in this space. And I was drawn to it and I'm staring at her. I noticed that I lost him. Like I couldn't, and I, I go, oh yeah, he's there. Mm -hmm. And I'd look at him and his animation and his muscularity and, and how, you know, whatever, and his, the abstractness of whatever it is he was doing, and she disappeared. And I'm thinking, how could this possibly be that you could have people this close together and you can't put them in the same space at the same moment, right? And so I, I thought, let me pursue this. Let me actually go back a second. In the, in the back of this painting, there's a, an indication off to the left side. Is it the left side? Yeah. Of a suitcase. So I started thinking about, oh, the, it's travel. Somebody's come here. Mm -hmm. they, maybe they both came here. Maybe she came and he lives there. Maybe, you know, maybe it's that there, there's always an erotic component to travel, to the fantasy of travel. So maybe it's about that. She's, she's gone off to, and she's going to have an affair with, uh, you know, somebody local, uh, uh, you know, et cetera. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. But then I thought, well, because I can't get them in the same space at the same time. Maybe one is a fantasy of the other. Mm. So who's real is what I was thinking to myself in this first painting. So I did another painting. And in, in this painting, the second painting, I had them both in there. But over the painting process, he didn't really work, so he's, he moves out, except there's a sort of memory of him in a, in a sculpture in the background. So, so there's a presence there, but whatever. Then I, it didn't answer my question, so I painted another painting to see if I could bring him back into the same space. And again, uh, you know, he isn't here except, and it's hard to see in the slide, uh, she's looking over the mirror that's uh, there. She's looking past the mirror to something on, outside of our view. So you presume he's still there, plus there's the, another reference to his presence on the tapestry on the back wall. I'm like, okay. Uh, so I try another painting to see if I could get him in. And by this time, she's no longer looking for him, right? And uh, in fact, she's looking through her suitcase for something she's, you know, to, to wear or to find or worried she's lost or whatever, she's looking elsewhere. And, uh, and then this is the final painting that I did in that series where she kind of returns to that almost fetal position that she was in at the beginning, right? And, and then I'm like looking at these things and I'm seeing something else and what I'm seeing that I, I wasn't aware of until it was over was that not only did I, I, I paint this drama happening within a relatively narrow set of time and space. I mean, it's, it's a small environment that, that uh, she occupies and, and maybe it takes place over the course of an evening or something like that. But when I looked at the body language, I realized that I painted a much greater sense of time, which is to say I painted a life that starts from a fetal position, then crawls, then stands, mm -hmm. then bends, and then finally returns to And to that, that was not something that you even really noticed until No idea. Was done. Yeah, and that wasn't part of the thing at all, but it, it followed some kind of internal logic that I just stayed hmm. true to. And, and so I, uh, the, the title of the sequence is uh, Travel of Romance. And, uh, and sort of follows her through her life and through this fantasy moment of hers. Um, it, you'll also notice in this painting, it was first, first time I ever did it where I, I, I literally, it was almost like a five-act play. It was very s staged 
environment in which this, and of theatrical lighting and stuff in which this thing took place. So. Do you work with live models? Uh, no. So when you say that you staged it in theatricality with uh, lighting, et cetera, this is all being just it's generated all, all by my your manipulation, manipulation yeah. and your mm -hmm. imagination. Yeah, exactly. Huh. Um, this is another uh, uh, series that I did, uh, uh, you know, continuing the narrative uh, thing. Uh, it's, it's called The Bed, The Chair, and then uh, the, the, I did several paintings and each one had a sort of a qualifier attached to it, like the bed, the chair, the sitter, the bed, the chair, waiting, the bed, the, anyway. And what I'm showing you here is uh, the photo collage uh, process. Uh, and in this case, what I did was I thought it would be interesting to take a, uh, some elements that stay the same over the course of the, uh, the, the paintings. Um, in this case, it's a bed and a chair, sometimes two of the chairs. But it, they're, they're the same. And then different people come and go through this thing. So in a way, it's like a hotel room, you know, where, it, where, the, where the, uh, the constant is the furniture and the thing. And, uh, so when you make the photo collages, uh, do you stage them with actual people? Are you pulling them from existing images in magazines or? No, like this uh, uh, photo, I mean this painting here, the girl in the foreground was a model of mine. Mm -hmm. uh, you asked me if I painted for models, I don't, but sometimes I have models and I take photographs of them. Uh, and we can talk about the photograph in a minute, but, the, uh, but so she was a model of mine years ago. And the, and the guy on the bed was somebody that I photographed at a beach in the Caribbean. Hmm. And, uh, you know, they just, I just kind of throw them together as appropriate. Uh, I mean, the, you know, the, the, the great thing about uh, painting, I, I think it's true of the arts, but the great thing about painting is that you don't have to put consciousness into conscious people. You can put consciousness into inanimate objects. Uh, like in this painting where that chair assumes a kind of uh, a witness role. Mm -hmm. You know, it seems like whatever is the relationship between these, this woman and this guy, somehow the chair is negotiating that, you know. Uh, which I, was the magic of painting. This is what I love about painting, so. But the characters, as you say, you don't have to put consciousness into a conscien conscious being. So again, like a writer, you'll start a narrative uh, and your humans basically take on a life of their own. You don't always necessarily know what they're gonna do in the end. No, except that, and, and I, I'm, I know writers talk about this a lot. There's a, there's a point at which if the character belongs in that room, you can't make that character do anything that it won't do, mm -hmm. right? That, it, that there, there are just some things that you have to say, okay, forget it. It's not going to be this. It's not going to be that, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So. Well, it was like, you know, with Bad Boy, you tried lots of characters in that room right. until the one. Until the one was right yeah. for it. Yeah, yeah. I did a... Uh, a series I was invited to do in Germany, in Krefeld, Germany. They own a uh, Mies van der Rohe house, two houses actually, his first uh, modernist residences. And the, uh, they're part of the museum now, and the museum does exhibitions in there, and they invite artists to participate in, in it. They ask the artists if they would enter into some kind of dialogue with either the history of the, the architecture or in some way have a relationship with it. So, it's, so when they asked me to do it, asked me what I would do, I said, well, you know, it, it was a house. It was, people lived in this house. And so what I would propose I would do would be to furnish the house, hire some actors, take a bunch of photographs of them in different rooms of the house, mm -hmm. And then I'd go home and I'd make paintings and what, what the show would be was these paintings hanging in the rooms that supposedly the action took place in. It would be like calling back the ghosts of, of the, this thing. So 
this is a, a photo collage again of uh, uh, that I did from um, from that series, and that's the uh, painting made from from that. In this uh, series, <clears throat> which was five five rooms, I guess. I, uh, what became a question uh, fairly quickly was, whose house is this? Mm -hmm. Is it her house? Is it his house? Are they married? Is this an affair? Does it, you know, how, how do I uh, know who these people are? And so kind of from room to room, I would try to look for the answer to that. And uh, the more I painted, the less I got in terms of answering that question. By the time I was done, I, I still didn't know But you who created it was. a relatively deep mystery then that you could play with. And how did you feel that it worked when you finally got the paintings back into the space? In terms of like uh, enlivening the room yeah. or something like that? Or, or, or giving you the answer that, <laughs> that um, you thought you were going to get? The, uh, the answer f wasn't whether they were married, not married, affair, or not affair. What it was was, the answer was, this relationship doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, not because of me, but it doesn't actually work. That they're, that they're, 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 you know, they're all wrong for each other. <laughs> but I did this thing too, I, uh, this is an aside. So I hired these two actors. Now they're German, and and I don't speak German. I did it from headshots. I was kind of looking for types more than anything else. I had no idea. I didn't care whether how good an actor they were because I I they were going to be taking. I was taking still photographs and no dialogue. But did you tell them more or less what to do? Or you just... I, what I did was I'd never worked with actors before, so I I went to my friends to uh, like Marsha Norman and you know people who work with actors and mm -hmm. you know how do you how do you make actors go? <laughs> well, what are how can are they human? Can you talk to them? <laughs> do they you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and and I got great advice back. One one was that oh give them problems. They love to solve problems. <laughs> So it's like, what's a problem, <laughs> you know? Oh, you know, simple things. She wants a hundred bucks from him, but she won't tell him why. It's like, oh, okay. okay. So I did. I, I made up little problems, and, and, uh, and I set them off. And as I said, I'm taking still photographs, so I'm not thinking I got to capture uh, the narrative, I got to, you know, get the dialogue, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I just, I'm, what I'm looking for is real body language. Mm -hmm. Right, which is re the reason I hired actors as opposed to models. And um, I was surprised very quickly by two things. One is that if I gave them a problem they couldn't get their teeth into, the whole thing was dead. Mm -hmm. There was like zero body language, right? And the other thing was that if I gave them something they could really get their teeth into, it was so riveting, I forget to photograph. <laughs> I'd just be sitting there going, wow. <laughs> yeah, it was just completely into this, the moment, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Which surprised me again, because I didn't think it was necessary to know that or to feel that, because all I was taking was still photographs. Anyway, my wife April was convinced the guy was a porno actor. <laughs> You know, he, he, he's thought that every scene should end with them naked. <laughs> Which she may have had a point. <laughs> so who knows? The, the, the other thing is because I, I uh, did this all off of the web and stuff and I was looking at headshots, I wasn't paying a lot of attention to details. And when they showed up, you know, he, he was this big strapping German guy, you know, mm -hmm. and, and she was about this tall. <laughs> and I'm looking at this thing going, Oh, this is going to be really interesting, you know. Yeah. How am I going to get that to work? Um, anyway, the final uh, day of shooting, we're now in the bedroom. And, uh, you know, he, over the course of these four or five days, 
you know, she's tried to express to him in no uncertain terms she's completely uninterested in him, et cetera, but she's a professional actress and she's going through all of this stuff and whatnot. So I constructed a scene and it's zero going on. It was, it was bad. So I, uh, he, he got up and he went to the bathroom and, and, or someplace, have a cigarette or whatever, and, and I, the, uh, the bed had this, like, netting over it. It was like a some kind of modernist Swedish thing that made this mosquito netting look like an igloo. And so I told her, I said, you know, uh, you're a wild animal. Whatever you do, don't let them in the bed, right? And we pulled the netting down and she like recoiled to the far reaches <laughs> of the back of the bed among the pillows and she sat there and I was fantastic by, I mean, she just like turned into this animal. Right? And she's just sitting there, sitting there, right? And he comes back in, and she's naked. And he comes out, he goes, oh. <laughs> you know, big moment here, <laughs> oh. And he takes his clothes off, you know, and he walks over to the uh, bed, and he starts to lift up the netting. And she comes flying across the bed and smashes him in the face, <laughs> right? And he like reels back. And he goes, oh, oh. And I'm going, oh. Anyway. That's, that's a pretty good aside. Yeah. Well, you know, you said you wanted to say some words about how photography uh, uh, interacts with your painting. And one of the things that you said when you and Ross and David and I were talking about. Uh, what kind of project we were come up, coming up with, and you had some opinions about the, uh, the supremacy now of photography and f filmic media over painting. Mm -hmm. And yet, you are very definitively a painter, but you're using photography to get to where you want to go. Right. Um, it seems a little bit of a conundrum, but... Well, I mean, there, first of all, photography, painting, and film do three very different things in terms of, of how the, the, the experience enters your being. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I will give you a dramatic, uh, hopefully not too overstated, but a, a dramatic example of how I mean that. Uh, years ago, I uh, saw a, f a terrific photography show at the Modern, and there was this uh, Nicholas Nixon photograph of a dying AIDS patient. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it was terrifying. I mean, the, just the skeletal, uh, you know, look of this, this suffering person that clearly the <clears throat> he was not going to live past this photograph almost. I mean, it was, it was that close and that tragic. And, it, and it, it was a photograph that was just him and me, right? It was that direct uh, uh, a kind of confrontation with all the terror of, of dying, illness, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and it, uh, it, you know, the image burned on my brain and made me want to run out of the room, okay? Now, I had not actually that sh long before seeing that. I had been in Paris, and there was an uh, Edward Monk show. And in that show was uh, one of his famous paintings of his dying sister. And it's a painting of her, you know, very near death. She's, she's in her bed, her matted, sweaty red hair, her, you know, consumptive pallor, I mean, everything about it was, was you know, the, the evidence of, of uh, near death. Uh, the, the mother was there by the side of her bed. She was, you know, bent over, you know, in, in crying or, or whatever, fear. Anyway, I'm looking at this painting and, and I'm you know, my, my heart is uh, going out to this girl and to the, to the mother and, and, uh, and whatnot. But in order for him to make this painting, 
he, he not only had the, to look really closely at what matted, sweaty, ill hair looks like, what, what the shape of her, the weight of her head against the pillow, how to, how to paint that, uh, you know, what, what the color at the end of her nose was, how open her mouth was, uh, what her shape looked like under the, under the covers, what the mother looked like. Uh, he opened a window, and there was a breeze that gently blew a curtain in, and there was a, a glass of water half full sitting on the bureau. And so there were these details, right? And I'm looking at them, and, I'm, and as I'm looking at them, <clears throat> what I realize is happening is that he's showing me that I can stay in the room with death. That I, can, that I can actually handle this moment because I can follow him as he saw everything, right? And, it, and it's something, the, the photograph captures everything, but you don't necessarily see it. Right. And you don't commit it to, to a kind of observance. Uh, so in a way, it seems fleeting. And, and the life of this uh, dying AIDS patient as a death mask and stuff like that, the, it's on your brain as a, as a just image of horror and whatnot. But in terms of being able to handle the experience of death, you know, as a loved one or whatever, is not there. And so I think that that's one way to describe the difference between a, a certain photographic things and certain, you know, painting things. So how do you get to the point in your paintings where what you're describing from looking at the Munch painting that we get from looking at your painting, how do you get to that place from the photographic collage that you do to imbue the, the painted object with that same kind of feeling, which I think is there? The, um, what the photograph taught me, well, well first of all, the, uh, a, a photograph slices life so thinly that everything is in motion and everything is off balance. And if you want to create a visual narrative, you have to have motion. If you don't have motion within the narrative, you have just painted a still life, right? So what, what, that's one way that photography has informed my work is that it, it, it shows and, and the motion that it shows, because it's, as I said, it's life so thin. It might be that you just, somebody's just slightly slumping a shoulder. Somebody's beginning to turn. Somebody's starting to get up. You know, someone's just a little bit odd in there, you know. <clears throat> and that's what, what, uh, what triggers the narrative. As I, I find these people, I, I never question it when my eye lands on somebody you know, do, doing whatever they're doing. There's a point at which I realize I'm, I'm sort of in reverie mm. looking at this thing. And, you know, hopefully I have my camera and I take a picture of it. And, and then the painting is like trying to find out why. why. Why that as opposed to this? You know, you see somebody who's, who's, who's kind of turning and, and you say, are they turning because they just heard somebody come in the door? Are they turning because somebody said something that they didn't like and they're kind of going like, are they bored? You know, that kind of thing. Or did they just have a painful thought and they kind of turn from themselves in that, right? So all of those things are within that little gesture that just happened. And then, you know, as I get interested in the possibilities of that, I start to figure out, so if it's about somebody having a painful memory, what's the light look like? Mm -hmm. You know, do you, do you burn them out with the light as a way of, of sort of getting the, you know, the obliteration of a hard and difficult thought? Do you, do you put them into the umber as a way of, of you know, the, the shadow world of our memories? It's, you know, it just goes like that. Mm -hmm. and it starts to, to define itself as to how this could, could be. Hmm. So. So it takes on a, a life outside of the, of the collage. Yeah. That's well, really and this, basically just the, the 
this well, starting point. I'm glad we're, we're going to end on uh, the painting that follows this, I think. I, I don't remember what it is. But um, there is, this is a, a, a collage beach thing. All these characters, uh, you know, that starts in the upper left corner. And, and it's a, uh, you know, I just started with this as an idea. There's a group of people, and some are walking this way, and some are walking that way. If, if you had asked me, can you see it in the big? Uh, it's a little hard to see, it's so blurry. Can, is it blurry to you guys? Yeah, it needs to be, is there a focus? Well, it doesn't matter, so we're almost at the end anyway. <laughs> You're gonna have to take my word for this. But. In the upper left collage, there's a, a, a figure in there of a, of a slightly overweight man in a striped green and whitish bathing suit, sort of in the middle ground. He's just part of the crowd. If someone had come up to me at that point and said, is that the main character in this scene? I would have said, are you out of your mind? Of course not. This is, you know, there's all these other things going on, blah, 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 blah. But as you begin to follow the sequence, you begin to see him emerge. Mm -hmm. and he becomes a constant through this thing. He's, you know, he gets smaller, he gets larger, he walks through stuff, the, the, the crowd fans out, you know, the, et cetera. And the painting, ultimately, is just him. And, uh, you know, again, as I said, if you'd asked me at the start, is he your guy, mm -hmm. I, I would have you know, laughed, you know. So it's, you know, and of course, that's the fun for me is, how is it going to turn out? Maybe? Yeah, exactly. I'm going to. I'm starting the story, but I don't know how. Yeah, it's going to... I have no idea. Why That's... is it called stupidity? Well, it, first of all, it's part of a uh, a five painting sequence that uh, is titled uh, "Scenes from Late Paradise." Mm -hmm. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> I mean, is paradise, to early ha paradise does paradise have a time to it? You know, apparently it does. Apparently it does. It's, it's, so it's a, you know, it's a late paradise, sort of the coming to the end of something, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> in the first scene in Scenes from Late Paradise is a, is a crowd scene of people like a, almost like a freeze. They're all walking in sort of file in some way, walking across the, the canvas towards some light, towards something off. They all seem to be focused on whatever it is that's off the uh, edge of the canvas you can't see. But they're all walking towards it. And there's some little white dogs and they're walking towards it as well and stuff. And that sort of starts it off. And, you know, it's obviously, it's uh, idyllic in that it's a beach and it's sunny and it's beautiful. And, uh, and, and over the course of these five paintings, they're, they're, things start to happen that begin to unravel the, the uh, comfort and the beauty and the, the pleasure of the place. And, uh, <clears throat> and then this is the last uh, scene in which, you know, clearly now the sea is roiling and the, you know, a major event storm-wise is happening of which he seems to be walking into it, <laughs> you know. He <laughs> seems oblivious to it. And, and if you saw all the paintings together, you would see it starts off with everyone going this way. And he's going the other way. And he's way. going by. <laughs> but uh, anyway. So he's walking, to, marching to the tune of his own. I, to it, yeah, and, you know. God, save him. Well, that sounds like it might be a good place to, to, to stop and let people ask you I questions. I think so, yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so, this is, this is where you get to ask anything you want, and then we can make up an answer. I know you've all got questions. You, oh, look, actually, there's some out there. Wow. So, uh, so this was good. Before you became iconoclastic and this was going to be about portraiture, I was going to ask about the role of narrative in, in portraiture. As, as you've moved for your, you know, I don't know if it's commissioned or not, but you're painting some people and they want a nice, they want a picture. To what extent does this process 
So your sense of narrative or adventure or sort of seeing what happens, does that play out when you're doing a portrait? Could everybody hear the question? The, the question is, what, does the role, uh, what is the role of narrative in the, in the portrait paintings? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the, the portrait uh, paintings start out the same, which is to say they start out with me taking photographs of people that I want to paint um, and then collaging things together. And uh, so none of the paintings uh, the result from that are come from one single source. It wasn't one sitting or something. It was like a chair from this thing, uh, you know, uh, uh, the light source from this, the, this figure, if it's a couple, it's, you know, he's in this photo, she's in that, and whatever, and they, I blend them together and, and do that. In, in uh, you know, they're, they're portraits, but they're, what they are is, is like uh, people, there's, they're just like people. And so there's a kind of, now you, you project onto them, I think, in a way that, like you would with the, the way narrative provokes, uh, that's kind of projection. Who are they? Uh, you know, why are they standing this way, smiling, not smiling? You know, why, why are they dressed this way, et cetera, et cetera. They're, they're types as well as specific people. So I think it is. but. They're also, for the most part, my friends, pe people that I hang out with, so they're, they're intimate uh, in that same way that I'm privileged to, uh, to watch them in sort of unguarded moments and stuff like that, and a lot of that uh, stuff is constructed from that. So, yeah. So it would seem as though the narrative really is between you and the artist and your subject matter as you're creating. Yeah. That's a very interesting, and that's what produces that mystery, because you're not quite sure, and either you, you're not giving the viewer the privilege of knowing your whole process, your process, so they're free to guess what that might be. <clears throat> yeah, well, the, uh, exactly, and the, the thing is that, you know, art to me is a, uh, uh, actually April says that, best when she talks about painting, uh, making itself vulnerable to interpretation. You, you, that's where you're trying to get to. I'm trying to get to a middle ground that puts the, the, this experience that I've created between you and me as a way of sharing that, that thing. But I'm not, I'm not uh, holding you to my interpretation of how, what it means or how I got there. Right? It's just simply, what I'm trying to do as an artist is find the precise tension between a meaningful moment and, and that next nanosecond where it loses the tension and becomes meaningless, right? There's, there's so, much, uh, so much of our, our daily lives are meaningless. They're just, they're quotidian. They just, they, you know, they're, they fill time and whatnot. But there are these moments that we have which inform our lives in, a, in the most profound way. And they come from a split second. They come from, from something uh, that triggers something. And, and, you know, it's unpredictable, it, et cetera, but it happens. And those are the ones that become part of your memory base. They become part of your character and stuff. And it's so, so it's like, how do, how do you find where that is? You know, if, if you're trying to be dramatic, do you, you know, how far before the defining moment do you go before you tell the whole thing and, and ruin it? You know, or, or how far after? There's the, there's the, the uh, leading up to some dramatic thing, which is, is one place that I think people, you know, narrative painters should stop. It's like, you know, either, either stop right before something happens or pick it up right after something happens. Those are two incredibly, you know, 
full pregnant moments in, in narrative uh, development. So. And even in your portraits, uh, it seems to me that that is the place where you are in your painting. Mm. So, you know, when you asked what the role of narrative is in the portraits, I mean, any, any picture that you make is a portrait in a certain sense, mm -hmm. but it's not so much a portrait of a person as it is the portrait of a moment. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe that's why when I look at your paintings, I always think of, of narrative fiction right, because I right. read a lot of fiction and I get most of my stories that way. Mm -hmm. But it's true that you know, when you're looking at, at almost anything that you've painted, it's always at one of those moments. Yeah. And mm -hmm. even if it looks like it's a straightforward portrait, it doesn't actually read that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a girl right here. That Between the faces? Uh, the, the faces, uh, why they're blue? Yeah, well, they're, the, the, the slide makes them blue. They're actually, <laughs> no, but, uh, no, that's okay. They're actually grisaille. They're this kind of grayish oh, okay. thing. But, yeah, the, you know, this is so dumb. You, you have like, uh, I, I mean, I had this thing where at the time that I was doing this, I was trying to be avant-garde. And I was trying to be avant-garde in a way that, that would, because I, what I was terrified of was that I was actually going to become an academic realist painter, you know, et cetera, which, you know, if painting was dead, which we all knew it was dead, academic or, or figurative painting was way dead, <laughs> right? And so I had this, like, idea, it was conceptual, Thing. It was totally idiotic, but I was saying, okay, the, the body uh, expresses emotion, the head expresses psychology, uh, the, the objects are, are meant as, as signifiers, right? And so I painted the objects as black silhouettes, I painted the body in a you know, looser gestural form, and I painted the heads in more detail to get a kind of psychological read on the character, and then I I like, uh, I would even go to the point where I wouldn't attach the head to the body. So, you know, I couldn't be accused of, you know, whatever I was afraid of being accused of. Fear you know. is a wonderful thing, isn't yeah, it? Yes, isn't it amazing, yeah. So anyway, I followed that for a while and then thought, this is really stupid. But, <laughs> and, you know, yes. yes who, who would you be willing to acknowledge as influencers? Starting what year? <laughs> 1920? Uh, 20, well, I, Baltus was painting in the 20s, so I would say he's, he's somebody for sure. Matisse is uh, uh, somebody, Picasso. Or those, those artists would be it. Um, uh, the, um, you know, Bonnard, uh, Beckmann later, uh, people like that. Before that, Manet, Degas. Michelangelo. <laughs> I mean, I... Uh, Keep going backwards. You know, the, what I love about Manet was that, I, you know, all right, so first of all, to, uh, at the point that I came into the figurative, uh, to the narrative and the figurative, et cetera, et cetera, there was a hundred years uh, between when that was done and, and now kind of thing, more or less. So I had to kind of reach back that far to sort of try to pull things forward that I could use. So Manet was a, a, an artist that I responded to, not, not for the narrative uh, part of his work, but because he, he figured out a way of creating a believable rendering of reality that was solely paint-based but gave you the impression, like a photograph does, that this is real, right? He, his, his paintings are highly codified. You look at how he renders uh, uh, the hand, and, and it's, it's two colors, you know? It's a, it's, a, it's a very schematic shadow form that he puts onto the thing, something like that. It's not the first thing you see when you look at his work. The first thing you see 
is the boy with the flute standing there, you know, da-da-da, right? You accept the reality of it. You accept the, the realism of it. And then discover how incredibly abstract this is, right? Which is what photography does for us. Photography, especially black and white photography, you, you accept it as, as real when there's nothing real about it, mm -hmm. right? So I, I like that access. That, that was something that I pulled forward, was I wanted my paintings to have that kind of thing where people didn't question, have to do the questioning going into the work. What is this? What is this artist trying to do? Why am I looking at this? What does this mean? Blah, blah, blah. They were already in the painting going, what is going on here? Why do I feel this way? This is person, is this going to happen? Is that going to? So, so I, I kind of got rid of that uh, uh, aspect of it. Uh, Degas was somebody who I responded to his voyeurism. I responded to the, he, he's an artist that found many ways of positioning the male gaze that was incredibly inventive and, and highly charged, right? And so that was something that I wanted to pull forward. Um, Bonard is a, an artist that I uh, responded to because he's, he, his domestic scenes are fraught with tension, but it's not the first thing that you, you, you think of him for. You think of him as, as somebody who's painting this exquisite impression of light and, and uh, you know, all, all of the kind of uh, intensity of color as light within this kind of domestic environment. So you don't notice that the person he's painting is totally depressed, <laughs> right? Because what's around that person isn't depressed. Right. And, he, and that the way he works those two things, I think, is such a compelling uh, uh, experience. So he's an artist that I have looked at as well. But you know, I think that we will stop because that's a beautiful place to, to end the talk. Uh, I want to thank you for being so incredibly generous in sharing uh, your influences, your ideas, and your process, because there are not, a, a lot of artists don't like to talk about where their ideas come from. And, yeah, what's and, that about? And, and how to do that. <laughs> but I think, you know, process is really everything. So uh, you were very generous tonight. Thank uh, you well, so much. Well, my pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. All right.